our uh, spring shift in California so, because it's this is my last it's lecture full daylight from Australia I mean, the windows there the Buddha Hall the, in Berkeley because in two weeks when it's my turn again I will be there uh, and everybody here I'm looking at today will be <laughs> looking at the screen and going yeah wasn't he just here you know how can we miss you if you don't go away you know that's that funny global phenomenon so um, I'm looking forward to being back, but I'm also already regretting having to leave this beautiful place. So that's uh, that's my schedule. So let's start today the way we do traditionally by, I want to say, let's do a bookmark. We'll be back on page 38 and 39, but we're going to go to the front page of our sutra, and I'm going to sneeze, so I have to turn my sneeze button. Okay, what we do is we invoke the spiritual presence by uh, chanting the name of the Buddhas and the Bodhisattvas, the Flower Garland Assembly. And uh, I'm going to do it on my tack head banjo while we chant. So this, the, the melody goes like this. That that's the melody. Here we go, and we do it in Chinese. Namo da fang guang fo hua yan jing hua yan hai wei fo pu sa. We'll do it seven times. Ready? Namo da fang guang fo hua yan jing hua yan hai wei fo pu sa. Namo da fang guang fo hua yan jing. visualize a procession coming in as I do that. Good. Indeed. All right. So we're catching up. Now, uh, those of you who are joining us maybe for the first time, this is a text that has been in um, human knowledge. It's been in our ken for 2,500 years. Um, from when the Buddha first spoke it. And that uh, includes trans transformations of the text from the original non-written, the original oral tradition, through its first writ writing down into Indic languages, Sanskrit, for example. And then this translation to Chinese it jumped a continent, jumped a culture, jumped a language, uh, jumped generations, and now we're in the process of putting it into English and making that jump, those jumps again, trying to make sense of not just the words, but also the meaning. So um, the challenge for us is to uh, understand the nature of the text. What's it, what's it really about? And uh, that's uh, for us, who you know didn't start as Buddhists, for whom all these concepts are new. Um, it's a gradual evolution of understanding. We don't know uh, the Buddha's mind, but there's echoes. There are hints. There are uh, 
glimmers of what it might, how it might mean and how to use it. Let's say we understand the words. Let's say we have a clue about the meaning. How do we put it to use? Um, is, there, is there applications that yield value, that, that make it worthwhile? So let's, let's see. You, I think you hold the answers to those questions, um, questions that I ask myself every time I touch these texts. So let's, with those notions in mind, let's see what it says. Okay, I'm going to start with the Chinese that goes Piru, Zhenjin, and goes all the way down to Shan Neng Kai Chan, Shi Hui Mengu. Ready? Um, you're welcome to join me. Let's do this in unison. Call and response from such a distance is tough. So let's let's see if we can do it. Here we go. Piru, Zhenjin, Zhi Zuo Bao Guan, Zhi Yan Fu Ti Zhu, Sheng Wang Ding Shang. Yi Che Chen Min, Zhu Zhuang Yan Ju, Wu Yu Deng Zhe. Okay, there's a period. Take a breath here. Ready? Ci Di Pu Sa, Suo Yu Shan Gen, Yi Fu Ru Shi, Yi Che Er Sheng, Nai Zhi Di Qi Di Pu Sa, Suo Yu Shan Gen, Wu Neng Ji Zhe. Okay, another period. Here we go. Exhale. Take a breath. Yi Zhu Ci Di Da Zhi Guang Ming, Pu Mie Zhong Sheng, Fan Nao Hei An, Shan Neng Kai Chan, Zhi Hui Men Gu. I'm impressed. We've got some budding Chinese speakers here. That's great. All right. We're going to go across to the English now. And we can do this in, in, uh, in unison together, right? So um, as we read in unison, let me re remind people that those periods and indeed the commas and semicolons are there to tell us how to breathe. So that the, um, uh, my guess is that there's some deeper wisdom here that with those periods we digest, with those breaks. So as we recite together, it's good to use our, our mouths, but also to use our ears and listen to the the voices around us as we inhale, exhale, and breathe together. Then the sound is quite lovely. Okay, are we ready? Here we go. It is just as when real gold is fashioned into a fine crown and placed upon the head of a sage king who rules Jambudvipa, none of the finery adorning the ministers of state or citizens can compare to it. All the wholesome qualities of the Bodhisattva upon this stage are the same, in that none of the roots of the two vehicles, or even Bodhisattvas of the seventh stage, can compare to them. That is because when he stays on this stage, the light of his wisdom thoroughly destroys the darkness of sentient beings' afflictions and he is skillful in explaining the doors to wisdom for them. Okay, let's make sense out of this and see what it, see what it says. We're talking about an eight stage bodhisattva and we're at the end of the text, the end of the, the prose part of this text. So we're into what's called the boilerplate. This is the refrain. This, this, these patterns show up in the other grounds, seventh ground, sixth ground, fifth ground. And so here they are again, only it's up a notch. Our eighth stage bodhisattva is, uh, knows more, sees deeper. And as you say more and deeper, understand that it's talking about an internal process. This bodhisattva has refined his or her mind more purely than he had before. And so there's less darkness, there's more light. That's what it means more and deeper. It's not that he grows anything, it's that he removes what is covering something that is uh, full and perfect to begin with, his Buddha nature. So, okay, what's he like? What is she like? This Bodhisattva state makes him uh, primum inter pares. He's the first among equals. That is to say, analogy time, right? What's it like? It's like Zhenjin. Now, Zhenjin, we used to translate this as true gold. Uh, 
real gold is not much better. Can you have false gold? Yeah, you have fool's gold. It looks like it's gold, but it's not the real thing. But even gold that you have, if you don't refine it, it's not as valuable. So what is real gold? Mm, you'd say pure gold, probably. Pure gold is probably a better translation. Um, 24 karat is gold that has zero impurities. It's all of the various trace elements are gone. The Bodhisattva is not quite there yet, but pretty close. It's just like, okay, there you go. It's hard to describe, so we're going to give you a picture that we recognize so you can infer what it must be like. It's like when pure gold is fashioned into a fine crown and put on the head of a sage king hmm, who rules Jambudvipa, Sanskrit word. Ding, ding, ding. Get an alarm there. Jambudvipa. This is a word out of Buddhist cosmology. Um, the Through the Buddha's eyes, um, geography looks different. The heavens look different. Um, he described a world as having a polar mountain, and that polar mountain is called Mount Sumeru, Sumeru, and the polar mountain is interesting, it's inverted, it's an inverted pyramid, which doesn't seem logical, but that's how he described it, it's flat on top, and surrounding it are four continents, and surrounding the continents are seas, oceans, and then there's mountains that form a perimeter. So we have the Iron Ring Mountains, the oceans of fragrant water, and the four continents. Jambudvipa is one of those continents, and it's ours. This is our continent. This is where we live, according to the Buddha's vision of how the world is made. Okay, all right. So, meh, there you go. Parallel alternate geography. Uh, those of you who study the makeup of Earth and the planet, and uh, the uh, we ha I have a friend who's a geologist here in, in down in Victoria, and uh, he when he looks at the ground, he sees very different things than I see when he looks at the, when I look at the ground. You know, dirt, right? No, he looks at history. When you look at the planet, you're looking at history because that piece of of terra firma has gone through all kinds of changes. Mm, okay, Jambudvipa is another way to look at the world. It's like a crown put on the head of a king who rules Jambudvipa. Notice it says sage king. What was the Chinese? Sheng Wang. Here's the Chinese. Sheng Wang. A Sheng is somebody who has gone beyond ordinary uh, everyday humanity to another another stage of evolution hmm. sages are said to have gone beyond birth and death they've already transcended mortality and a king means among sages they are the uh, rulers the, the best the best among sages so they rule the sages and they're kings of Jambudvipa. What are the qualities of a sage? Oh my goodness, wisdom, right? Kindness, right? Mm. <laughs> not going to do it. I'm not going to be tempted to make commentary on our current situation of rulers and lack of sagehood. I'm not going to do it. I'll just, by, by the absence of my comments on the current situation, you will know my opinion. So nobody cares about my political opinion. That's not so valuable. Sutra is valuable. So, Sage King, crown on his head, made of gold, rules Jambudvipa. There we go. That's our image. What's the point of it? It says that individual you look up to. You admire what they say. You absorb what they say. You and follow them because they've got integrity. They've got that charisma, that quality of light that makes you pay attention to them, that moves you even, uh, that kind of touches your heart and your head at the same time. So you follow them. The Bodhisattva is that way too. Okay, there we go. Now we got our 
analogy. We got our picture in there. The sutra is trying to tell us that this bodhisattva is special. Nobody else in the kingdom has a crown or the inner qualities of the sage king who rules. No living being is the same as the bodhisattva. The sutra in our second paragraph even specifies. He says, the bodhisattva on the, the eighth stage is just the same as the king of Jambudvipa in that nobody can compare to him, even bodhisattvas on the seventh stage. Don't have his level of, her level of self-understanding. They still have, they're still ruled by their ego to an extent. They're still ruled by their desires. The bodhisattva, although this has got to be, you know, a seventh stage bodhisattva is pretty ego free, right? But compared to the eighth stage, they can still be considered uh, inferior or not up to par. That's what it's trying to tell us. Special guy, really special. Um, what are the two vehicles? People think, oh, that must be uh, here in Australia. One's a ute, right? The other one's probably an SUV, <laughs> which vehicles, right? Maybe even a minivan. No, that's not different vehicle. Vehicles in the sense of uh, things that carry. And, okay, important point here. This, this was a hard one for me to grab. Um, the idea that every stage of uh, accomplishment in the Buddhist path is a role, R-O-L-E. It's a, uh, think of a play. If you're the lead, if you're the co-star, if you're the villain, if you're the heroine, those are all roles in a play, right? In the same way, um, the Bodhisattva, the uh, solitary Buddha, the sound, the voice hearer, the arhat, the Buddha, those are all roles. There's nobody there. This I had to, I had to think about this to grab it. Um, the first time I this made sense to me was when um, in Samantabhadra's Practices and Vows, that final closing chapter of the Flower Garland Sutra, it talked about how it said, and living beings who cultivate according to these ten vows will be the next Samantabhadra. And it was like, wait a minute, wait a minute. There's only one Samantabhadra, right? No, it's a role that you inhabit when, you're, when you take your nature, which is very flexible and plastic and cultivate it to the stage of wisdom and compassion of Samantabhadra, you become Samantabhadra. And you can move on. You decide you've done that long enough. You can be Guan Yin. You can be an Arhat. You can be a sage king when your inner qualities merit that. What would be an example? Um, you get elected as chairperson of your neighborhood association. Okay, you fill in that role. Are you fundamentally the chair, a chairperson forever and forever? No, you, in, you have the jobs, the responsibilities, the title, the duties of the chairperson. And these stages the sutra is talking about is the very same way. It's that these are stations along the road to all ignorance gone off your nature. There's no, as you can say, it's very impersonal. There's no you there, even when you're Guan Yin. Guan Yin is a stage of wisdom and compassion. Isn't that, that's interesting. Huh? I, I had to work on that. By the way, if anybody's concerned about did I get hit? No, that's my hat. Sam, could you hand me my hat? I'm going to demonstrate my Akubra bump here. There we go. This somebody's going to say, what's wrong with the monk? There? So when I wear my hat, it's a little tight, right? So that, That's why I've got my hat. So just in case anybody was worried. What's wrong with the monk? So, okay. Uh, that's my Akubra stage uh, when I put that on. I fill in the role and the duties of an Akubra hat wear. So um, that, that was interesting to think that we're describing the Avatamsaka Sutra as what? As a handbook. 
It's a manual. It's a tech doc. It's a PDF that you download along with your new microphone so you can learn how to hook it up or your new sound recorder, you know, your new lawnmower. It's that's what it is. And yes, it is a sacred text. It's a scripture. It's holy writ. It's something that you put on the center of the table with a nice drape over the top and don't put newspapers or coffee cups on it. It's that too. But when you open it up, how is this text meant to be used? It's kind of a heritage document for humanity that the Buddha got to first or that person who became the Buddha, who was a prince who had no idea what a Buddha was when he started. But he just kept working on him, his mind, working on his mind, working on his mind until there was no more darkness to transform. Oh, I'm awake, right? Are you the Buddha? I don't know. What's a Buddha? I'm awake. Something like that. So it's, it's really, it's a how-to. And again, to say, it's not personal, nothing personal. <laughs> there's no, no body home. When, you, when you're done, there's, no, there's even less anybody home than when you started. That's success, to have nobody home when you're done. The self has been transformed, and you and everyone are a single uh, substance with no ego to block it at any point. That's success. So our eight-stage bodhisattva still has a quality of ignorance, but not much. So, okay, that is because when he stays on the stage, the light of his wisdom thoroughly destroys the darkness of sentient beings' afflictions, destroying darkness. He is skillful in explaining the doors to wisdom for them. There you go. Darkness destroyer. It's a new Marvel superhero. Destroyer of darkness. The darkness of afflictions, so such as greed and anger and delusion and pride and doubt. Those are the things that come up when we meditate. Oh, man. That's so interesting, right? There's a lesson there. When we meditate, uh, especially the first, mm, first couple months, if you actually throw yourself into the practice, and then as you progress, it, uh, that this phenomenon doesn't stop, which is what? The harder you work, the more garbage arises. And it's a responsibility of the teacher to tell his or her meditation friends to expect that. There are people who will tell you, they say, oh, you know, I took refuge. I became a Buddhist disciple last week. And I even took the precepts. And since that time, I've been miserable. And I think I made a mistake. I want to give it back. <laughs> I'll give you your refuge and your precepts back. I've had nothing but trouble. I've had sleepless nights. I've had nightmares. I've had trembles. And I go around with all these stuff, you know, going on. That's the job of the meditation friend or teacher to say, really? Well done. Congratulations. That's the good part. And mean it. And not, you're not joking. Why? It's because it's not that with the refuge and with the precepts or with any kind of progress. This is tr even more so for people who take the bhikshu precepts or the bhikshuni precepts or who make a vow. As soon as you make a, a, a commitment along the path, what happens is light ensues and the darkness is dislodged, you could say. Be prepared for the blowback. Be prepared for the exhaust phase of the process. You all know about combustion engines, right? Intake, compression, power, exhaust. Intake, compression, power, exhaust. Those are the four stages of, of the piston in your car, or I guess you have fuel injection now, right? So I got to throw away my analogy. So intake, the gas and the, oil and the air come in. Compression, the piston comes up. Spark with a spark plug, power. Ooh, it pushes down, the crankshaft turns. Then the valve opens, out comes the, the carbon monoxide and the the soot and the smoke, intake, compression, power, exhaust, right? Your car goes down the road. And 
that's a good analogy for what happens when you are cultivating because now you've got a new promise it's your mind talking to your mind no doubt right it's your mind and your mind and you say i'm going to quit smoking because i'm now a buddhist i'm going to quit using the f word even in casual conversation because i'm now a buddhist okay well that habit energy of smoking and profanity comes up and you go no nope, gonna stop that now and i'm a buddhist and there's there's this smoke in your mind because you've just created some friction in what was before this very casual process of doing whatever you wanted now you say no there's goodness to be had by changing bad habits Ooh, stress stress right struggle and exhaust is the result and you flush it out of the mind and you go well that was good uh-huh well gee whiz i feel lighter somehow and over time you'll reclaim that much of the the nothing that is your birthright <laughs> congratulations you've got more emptiness well done you got more nothing well way to go yeah much less than before you know what yes that's the way it is and so get ready a good meditation friend or teacher tells the people he's meditating with to expect this uh this exhaust garbage is going to come up and when you're done you've got a garbage free environment inside you've got a cleaner closet you've got a tidier garden you've got more more insight more self recovered which is nothing at all sounds absolutely nonsensical doesn't it anybody who is listening without the context would think what are they talking about but boy once you go through it really uh even to the point where people who leave home i'm sure jin wei sure our newest monk and jin xiu sure are not so new monk and jin for sure are not so new monk have all have stories about leaving home and having just the craziest stuff happens sometimes, sometimes you get sick and some and if you're if a dharma friend is with them they say keep going keep going don't stop this is the good part just be patient you'll get through it and then you're before you know it you're up on you're halfway up the mountain right so yeah i remember um one of my favorite things to do is mountain walking. I'm not a mountain climber, I'm a mountain walker. And uh, I spent summers in the, uh, the Green Mountains of Vermont and the White Mountains of New Hampshire, in the Appalachian, the northern part of what was in the south is called the Appalachians. And uh, you get out of the car at the trailhead early in the morning, just at dawn, and you see the summit up there. And these are, mind you, like 6,000 feet mountains. They're not compared to the Rockies or, you know, there's not much to compare, but still this is the tallest peaks in the Northeast. And so you, you set out and you see the, the summit way up there and you're down at the trailhead and you, you set off and it goes through the, the dales and then down into the valleys and twist around by the Creek. And then it goes up and you pause it at noon and you go up and, about 3 p.m., you come out onto a ridge and you turn around and you look back and your car is this big down by the trailhead, tiny little car. And yeah, you're like 4,500 feet and you keep going and you check the time because you don't want to be back down before sunset. And you get up about six o'clock, uh, the trees are very thin and only come up to your waist you're above the tree line and you get to the summit and you're the tallest thing and and all you did was just do this you just kept moving your feet and staying with your friends and the birds are below you at the top the birds are flying a thousand feet below you and you can see miles and miles and miles and your body is all sweaty and 
it's exhilarating. But all you did was put in the effort, and sure enough, you're something very, very different. And coming down seems much quicker on the way down. But it's that, that experience of just putting one foot after the other. And if you quit when you were hungry, when your knees were aching and uh, you were sweaty, you'd never have that experience. So it's, it's good to have friends who keep you going during the exhaust phase. I'm mixing my metaphors wildly here, anybody who's keeping track of the images. But you get the point. So don't, uh, our bodhisattva has been smelting gold. Wowee. And uh, the gold is uh, in the process of smelting. He gets, he, he comes in contact with his afflictions, with living beings, sentient beings' afflictions. He's in touch with them because they are dark. And with his wisdom light, he destroys thoroughly their afflictions, darkness. And he's good at explaining the doors to wisdom for them. Okay, moving on. Any, before I go on, any comments, questions from the six of you in the room? <laughs> Not more than six. There's actually nine of you there. Any, you may or shama wen ti xiang wen qi wen. We're going to move on here. Alan, any comments? Tom, anybody? Oh, there's a microphone. Yep. You can be the temple. The closest thing we got is your, your mind. How's that? I agree. That would be great. Actually, we do. We do. I'll, I'll give you two of them. San Jose. San Jose? There are no mountains in San Jose. There is. There is. You go down... Uh, one, let's see. What is it? Is it... I guess it's 280. Go down 280 and get to San Jose. You go all the way through San Jose. You get to the Story Road exit. Right, Story Road. Turn, go east on Story Road, all the way to the end. It dead ends. And you're in San Jose, near the uh, Hispanic University there. The university, the Spanish language university. And you go turn right and uh, go to the end of, I've forgotten the name of our road. And uh, you go and you look up to the top and there's, it's these are the foothills of, the uh, uh, East Bay Mountains, and there is a temple on the top, and that's us. It's called Gold Sage. You have to wind your way up, and when you're there, all of the Santa Clara Valley, all of Silicon Valley is visible to you, and the coast range across to, that you get to Santa Cruz with. So there's one, you know, you can actually test out. So I'm giving you instant gratification. You ask for a mountaintop temple, we got one for you. Down there in San Jose. Another one is in uh, Hong Kong. It's uh, Tsushing Si. And mind you, it's not on the top. So it's not exactly the same dynamic. But Tsushing Si is, uh, Master Hua said, the, the di li, the, the feng shui, the layout there is like a bat. It's shaped like a bat, a bian fu. And our monastery is right there in the mountain. You can go on up and you can see the South China Sea. Hmm. It's very neat. It's on Landau. It's on Blue Island, um, Da Yushan. So that's a similar kind of experience. But, but yeah, uh, I agree. The problem with having a temple right on the very top is the wind. It's kind of good to have it just below the top, because it's right on the tip top. The winds are fierce, and uh, all of the stuff that that winds bring, like storms and stuff. So it's good to have it just below the peak. But I agree, that's really nice to, uh, if you got up there and you had a Buddha to bow to, you have to put up with your own, your inner Buddha, for sure. All right, I can see the, uh, the Buddha house there. You've been bathing the Buddha, right? Buddha's birthday. You kept it up. That was today, right? Jin Wei Shir, Buddha's birthday was today, celebration. Okay. So the Buddha, how many people came for lunch? Did you keep track?
Okay. 108, of course. Uh, no more, no less. <laughs> Great. So their Buddha house is set up there. It looks very nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Crowder. I was complaining today at our meditation here about the that Berkeley Monastery is too small. We really need to expand. So uh, actually somebody, I think it might have been Connie, I think, posted a, some video clips of the food in the parking lot today. Tables and tables of vegetarian food. And uh, it looked pretty good, actually. So we, on big days, we spread out in the parking lot with the tent. And uh, that's a uh, solution, I suppose, but we still need to bigger, bigger monastery. So anybody who's got a big church in Berkeley that uh, needs some monks, we're, we're ready. All right, moving forward here. Ready? We got another, another analogy. Fodzipiru 此菩萨施波罗蜜中，愿波罗蜜增上，与波罗蜜非不修行，但随力随分。使命略说诸菩萨摩诃萨第八不动地，若广说者，经无量劫不可穷尽。Okay, boilerplate, ready? Here we go. Disciples of the Buddha, it's the same way that a king ruling the great Brahma heaven, the sovereign of the threefold large thousand world system, can convey a kind mind everywhere and can radiate light that fills a thousand world system. The Bodhisattva upon this stage can also shine light that illumines as many world systems as there are motes of dust in a million Buddha kshetras, extinguishing the fire of sentient beings' afflictions and making them cool and refreshed. This Bodhisattva emphasizes the paramita of vows from among the ten paramitas. He does not fail to cultivate the others, but only does so according to his strength and his position. This is a general description of the Bodhisattva Mahasattva's eighth stage called the unmoving stage. Even in limitlessly many eons, it could not be completely described. Are you guys out of text? Do you have to have them? So you got them. Okay, good. Still got. Them. All right, there we go. Uh, let's see questions. I have a set of Buddha pictures. Okay, Locke has sent uh, forwarded a question. If I have sutra books and Buddha pictures, what uh, what should I observe and how should I store them? Okay, that's an interesting question. Um, there is. Uh, a traditional view of that. And people say that if you have a Buddha image, you can see behind me here, I'm going to lean over, here are Buddha images in the, from the Dharma Hall of our monastery here in the Gold Coast. See Buddhas standing, sitting, uh, Bodhisattvas on the sides. See, there's a nice Guan Yin and such. So traditionally, the thing that, that you do it is, um, let's say it's a picture on a page, a two-dimensional printed page. Um, it's good to, it, here's, here's a rule of thumb. How would you treat an image of your grandma or your grandfather? Uh, <laughs> and somebody said, you don't know my uh, grandfather. He's just, I don't know. So, okay, okay. But someone you care for, your grand, somebody worthy of respect. You wouldn't wrap fish in their picture, right? You wouldn't use it to line the bottom of a birdcage, right? You would respect it. And same thing with Buddha images. 
Um, I tend to take the middle way. There are people who um, are very almost even fetishistic. They kind of uh, make a big fuss over Buddha images. Um, I uh, and and there's another voice in there that says that uh, every bit of respect that you show to a Buddha image is that's the amount of of benefit that comes to you. I, I was saying some people are fetishistic, meaning they really they uh, make a big fuss over the images. And yet I've heard that if you, they say, uh, how does it go in Chinese? Yi fen gong jing, yi fen gan ying, wan fen gong jing, wan fen gan ying. If you show one part of respect, you get one part of response. If you do 10,000 parts of respect, you get 10,000 parts of response back. So, okay, so there we go. What my ordinary vision sees is that when I take a Buddha image, and put it in a visible place and even make an offering to it of what's what's appropriate um, light meaning a lamp or an oil lamp or a candle um, food an apple um, i use crackers in the morning because they're that's what i have crackers uh, some water some incense you've made it into an altar but what that does is it becomes the anchor for the room. It's the place where everything else circulates around. And um, if when things don't go well, which is regularly, right, just coming and being with that image on the altar can make a difference. It gives me something stable in the midst of chaos. And that's, I find that's true that the 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 alt the image the um altar for me i have a, a nice guan yin thousand hand guan yin image that that it doesn't change no matter what kinds of chaos and and uh you know storms roll through my life and my my living space the altar doesn't move and so i keep it clean and and offered too. I keep lights on it. And it's very, very nice. And you see that Buddha image sitting there day in, day out. And you think, how boring. Imagine just sitting there. And then when things go bad, you know, and you think, gee, if only I could sit there like that image. <laughs> you know? So we go all over the place, but the image is just stable and unmoving and a sense of calm and kind. Things are figured out and it's balanced. It's in harmony. It doesn't shake. Yeah. And mind you, uh, there are story upon story of how images uh, go through real disasters and unmoving. We had uh, one of our monk brethren, monk brothers in Taiwan, um, had a his family's house. He had left home, and he was at CTDB, and uh, his house caught on fire in Taipei, where his uh, parents and sister and former former wife he, who you know permitted him to leave home and become a monk they were all in the house and he had a, a large glass uh, uh, a um, like I don't know if people can see this kind of case right you can see right here glass doors and inside was a Buddha image and sutras he had the lotus sutra he had the in Chinese, the Avatamska Sutra, and the house burned, and it was a three alarm fire. They brought all of the local fire engines and pumpers, and I think it was he had a typical Taiwanese uh, four, three or four story um, vertical apartment building. And the whole thing burned, and when they uh, the the flames were doused, they went downstairs, and here was the glass case. The glass had not broken. There was water damage, but the Buddha was unmarked, unscathed. And they made the papers, and because around it was just ash, you know. Here was the Buddha image sitting right there, happy, you know, untouched, and the, 
the uh, the sutras had no no smoke smudge and impossible because the flames were a thousand degrees you know in there and so okay how about that so th the question is how do you want to relate to the buddha images um sutras is is easier they're books so you want to i think the most important thing is that you interact with the buddha image and and with the sutras uh to say, oh, they're safe, they're behind their glass door, and don't touch them, that's to miss the point. If you protect them right out of your life, you've, you've missed the point. Uh, you want to have them in your life. And Master Hua uh, would criticize people who put sutras into glass doored cases and never touch them. Because they're meant to be opened, get your fingerprints on the cover, turn the pages how many how many people who have sutras at home the pages are stuck together right because they never opened them they didn't take the knife and slice the paper you know when they stuck together so they're meant to be used and don't don't fear that somehow the buddhas are unhappy if you breathe on the pages the opposite is true they're meant to be opened and integrated into your life put them into your life that's i think what that's that's saying you know 10,000 parts of respect gives you 10,000 parts of, of response um, fundamentally I mean think about this here's here's the idea the um, what are the sutras they didn't exist at all until some person challenged himself to go out and face off with his mind and his fear and his limits and did yoga you could say and all the different kinds of yoga that were available to him in the woods from all the teachers until the darkness in his mind was transformed and the light they say there's light that just radiates from your nature okay he became the buddha from that same place in his nature he started to talk he had no sutra book there was no sutras for the Buddha, for the newly awakened prince. So he just started answering questions, started talking. And lo and behold, uh, came all this wisdom. People, he said, don't write it down. It's not there to become the possession of liter the literate class. It's there to help people get through their pain and misery and darkness and misunderstandings. But over time, after he entered Nirvana, the, um, the disciples said, we better write it down or we're going to forget it. So they wrote it down. And 2,500 years later, through all these iterations, we've got these books in our hands and online, you know, called sutras. Okay, well, there you go. How do you deal with it? What, what do you do with that? It's like, well, it's not meant to be stuck in a bookshelf antiseptically preserved with mothballs and you know so respect doesn't mean don't touch it you much better off uh having it out in the air and read than put behind the glass and preserved so if you get it if you stick it in your pocket between readings probably make it an upper pocket uh they say don't sit on the sutra stick it in your hip pocket and sit on it don't take it in the bathroom for extended reading, you know. So you want to, those are good. You wouldn't have a conversation with grandpa in the bathroom either. So, you know, um, I don't, I don't read sutras in bed. Um, so I, I, there are people listening right now who are thinking, oh no, do I have to get out of bed? This is so comfortable here. <laughs> yeah. And somebody asked that question, you know, it's two in the morning. Do you want me to get out and go out and, you know, I'm listening to your lecture from California and it's two in the morning. Of course, you know, common sense. Don't, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. But it's, if you throw your sutra under your pillow, uh, that's probably not the best. Bring it out, put it on the bookshelf, you know, the book side, the bedside table, nice and straight. So that's a, you know, common sense. Um, common sense is better than than all the rules. 
you know, there are people who come up with these crazy rules that, that the Buddha is going to be really upset with you if you don't follow the rules. You know? Oh, my goodness. All right. So there we go. I uh, got another question. We'll hang on to it so we can get more. Take, we, we read the sutra, but we didn't explain. Says what? Says the same way that a king ruling the great Brahma heaven can convey a kind mind everywhere, can radiate light that fills up a thousand world system. Okay, here's a claim. Um, it says that who, who's a king ruling the great Brahma heaven? That's a god. A, a lowercase g god, but nonetheless a god. That's a deva. That's a deva from what's called the Brahma heaven. Um, actually, from the Buddhist point of view, that's higher than Lord God. Higher than God on high. God, Lord God, the God of the Hebrews, is said to be Lord Chakra, uh, the second level of the desire heavens. And lofty, you know, powerful, pure, they say probably a bodhisattva. But above, he is still mortal, and he still has desire, still has affliction. And above him are the Brahma heaven gods, 28 levels of them. They are beyond desire, they're beyond affliction, and they are uh, in dhyana samadhi all day long. Brahma heaven, Brahma gods. And they say, I like this description, they convey a kind mind everywhere and send out light that fills up a, a, uni a thousand world system is a it's a kind of like a, uni a a galaxy with a thousand worlds in it so how do you like the idea of somebody radiating a kind mind conveying a kind mind everywhere what's the chinese it says nang pu yun si can convey can send out a kind mind everywhere. What would it be like? Let me think of that. I was uh, reminded of talk about neural plasticity. Here's a, this was in the Times. Natalie Angier wrote a, an article, you share everything with your bestie, even brainwaves. How about that? Um, there's a lot of, here, let me just read briefly, I'll just quote. This is New York Times author, Natalie Angier. A friend will help you move, goes an old saying, while a good friend will help you move a body. <laughs> and why not? Moral qualms aside, that good friend would likely agree the victim was an intolerable jerk who had it coming and geez, you shouldn't have done this, but where do you keep the shovel? <laughs> okay, good writing, clever. Researchers have long known that people choose friends who are much like themselves in a wide array of characteristics, similar age, race, religion, socioeconomic status, educational level, political leaning, pulchritude rating, even hand grip strength. The impulse towards homophily, okay, towards bonding with others who are at least other possible is found among traditional hunter-gatherer groups and advanced capitalist societies alike. Okay, so far so good. Like seek like. New research suggests the roots of friendship extend even deeper than previously suspected. Scientists have found that the brains of close friends respond in remarkably similar ways as they view a series of short videos. The same ebbs and swells of attention and distraction, the same peaking of reward processing here, boredom alerts there. The neural response patterns evoked by the videos on things as diverse as the dangers of college football, the behavior of water in outer space, and Liam Neeson trying his hand at improv comedy, she's a good writer, proves so congruent among friends compared to patterns seen among people who are not friends, the researchers could predict the strength of people's social bonds based on their brain scans alone. Okay, so there's, there's a, this is the article, which is what? It's saying, here's our bodhisattva, or here's our Brahma heaven king who, you, who conveys a kind mind everywhere. What does that say about um, our impact on our family if we cultivate and if we don't? Interesting. 
if you, because of your religious practice, your spiritual practice, your meditation, your generosity, your attention to your parents, sticking with them, taking care of them, if that brings you to a, a kind of peace of mind, everybody you touch during the day will pick up on it, says that research. To the point where if you, your friends and you may be totally in sync and you can, you know, you can see where it would go that, that you only look for people who are already in sync or maybe it's that how many people does it take in a, in a couple or in a family to bring everybody else in sync? And I suspect the answer would be, depends on how much samadhi, how, how, how powerful is your quiet mind? Some people, when they step in the room, you just know that they're radiating something for better and for worse. My, my best uh, laboratory for this is the BART trains. That's the Bay Area subway, Bay Area rapid transit. Man, oh man you'll be going under the bay, right? In the tube heading for San Francisco and some the car door will slide open and somebody will walk in who is way off. Somebody who's either mentally disturbed or just had a bad day or something and their state of mind, because you're here with strangers in a metal and plastic tube heading at speed, sitting together you didn't choose that group, but you're here. You are all together, enforced uh, comradeship, going at speed in one direction, and your minds are in sync. You're you're listening to the same broadcast. Let's say that, and you're at the mercy of whatever is on the radio. So on the mental radio you're sharing, and boy, if somebody comes in who's upset or just wacko, you feel it right away. And the opposite is also true. So I, whenever I'm on a BART train, I'm reciting the Great Compassion Mantra and just kind of experimenting and seeing whether I can uh, inject some, some compassion into people's day, starting with me, starting with my own, you know, keeping focused on that signal. My broadcast is Namo Hulada no Dola Ye Ye, you know, trying to bring Kuan Yin Bodhisattva's uh, spirit of fearlessness and courage and kindness there into the into the shared space into the shared room that we share in that train right so how interesting the research says that best friends will have the same responses to stimuli like a movie remarkably same so where do we go with that here's our bodhisattva who what conveys a kind mind everywhere not as an experiment on a bar train but always because why that's his her mind it's kind and can radiate light that fills a thousand world system this is a um this is an analogy it says that a brahma heaven king can do that through a thousand world system the bodhisattva on this stage the eighth stage shines a light that illumines that lights up as many world systems, here's a big Avatamsaka number. How many, how many motes of dust in a million Buddha lands, right? How many is that? To extinguish the fire of beings' afflictions and making them cool and refresh. So what are you doing with your meditation? I'm radiating light into Buddha, Kshetra's dust mote numbers of worlds and purging people's afflictions. That's charisma. Not bad, not bad. Um, our, our former president is no longer president. I can mention his name, it's not political. Uh, starts with an O, <laughs> sounds like sounds like he born in the Middle East. He's not, by the way, nor in Kenya. Barack Obama, him, that guy, he, I've, I have felt this effect when somebody asks him a question about uh, a situation in, let's say, Syria, right? 
and or let's take that's currently there's blood is being shed there let's move it off to something like uh a uh mm, for example let's say opening up cuba okay so in president obama's reign in his tenure uh, cuba was the uh, america stands towards cuba was was uh, changed right and as this is just a, 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 a type of, you know, this is just one example. As he talked about it, I found myself relaxing. And I found my brain grasping the ideas that he was communicating. Why? Because I trusted that he had thought it through. It's like, oh, oh, he knows something about that. He knows more than I do. That makes sense. That's reasonable. Mm-hmm. Okay, I understand. All right, so Cuba. Oh, cool. You know, like I was open to that because I trusted his ability to think it through and act wisely for the moment. At least that was a good, I, I see why you made that decision. Thank you for giving me those reasons. That's good. I like that. You know. So there's an example of an elected public official who radiates some sort of integrity for his intelligence and his analysis and his rationality. Great. All right. So there's one example. And our bodhisattva is able to shine light through all these worlds. And what, what happens when you get it? Sentient beings' afflictions, the fire of those afflictions are extinguished. It's like a fire extinguisher. Shh. He makes them cool and refreshed. Very cool. Uh, I, I watched um, the uh, fire marshal of Ukiah came out to the city of 10,000 Buddhas last week and taught. Oh, Alan is here. Alan's in the room. There's the guy. Alan is our safety. Uh, what's the official safety marshal? Alan, Alan, what's, John, Alan what's, your, what's your title? Head of security, chief of security. Safety guy. Uh, there we go. You're modest. Alan, you're just so modest. Alan's the safety guy. Good. You need a name type. Safety guy. So the chief fire marshal of, of Ukiah, count, Ukiah uh, City and Mendocino County came out to give us a fire extinguisher tutorial. And what, Alan, you want to just say one word about that? What was the official, what was his, he doing there? Yeah. Okay. Thank you for that. What I was impressed with was somebody on Instagram had, uh, or maybe it was Facebook, had video, did a quick video of the uh, fire marshal putting the, the canister, the red canister in the hands of various volunteers and said, okay, you know, and he had a, uh, a controlled burn plate on the, on the blacktop there. And it was a, uh, I'm sure he could, you know, ignite it and then put it out, ignite it and put it out. And he gave everybody a chance to take this bottle and go, whoosh, right? And just extinguish the flare, extinguish the fires. And as I was watching, I was fascinated. Had I been there, I would have been right in line to, to have, I would never fired off a fire extinguisher. But watching the white foam, uh, the fire retardant come out of the, the hose, <laughs> and hit the flames, the flames did not want to be extinguished. And I was watching chemistry at work, you know, here's real physics. This, the fire retardant came out in this white cloud and the guys and the girls are holding it and watching this thing, you know, kick back. And 
there's a time as you're watching the the uh, fire extinguisher retardant it's not doing it and then a little bit and then a little bit more and then oh fires are out the chemistry works and that fire had resistance to being put out it was fighting back for its life you know i don't know whether it smothers it taking the oxygen away or what it does it wasn't liquid i don't think but in any case it was watching the uh the the human the volunteer holding this chemical device that was extinguishing the fire and the fire fought back you know it didn't want to go out and then ah miela you know extinguished oh it's done but man it was it's not so easy it's not just like flipping a switch and the fire's out fire had power and it was it was overpowered but it was touch and go for a while and so living beings afflictions are such that our bodhisattva uh, is able to shine a light and the light is his wisdom and he extinguishes the fire of sentient beings afflictions and makes them cool and refresh and i was thinking whoa <laughs> go bodhisattva my afflictions have roots there's reasons why you know my afflictions are are long rehearsed long practiced much cherished i love my greed and my anger and my biases and prejudices and i don't give them up easy but this bodhisattva gives me um, a reason to let them go he can't do it but he gives me the reason to let them go until they're gone and just like the fire was out in the tray there on the blacktop in, in CTVB. Likewise, the afflictions fundamentally don't exist, but they're there because the conditions, mostly because I hang on to them. I hang, I'm in the habit of getting angry when my button is pushed. And I'm, you know, that's predictable because I I'm in the habit of it. But the Bodhisattva says, yeah, you know, imagine no affliction, imagine no anger. Reclaim that. That's your energy that you're using wrong, destructively. Reclaim the energy and your wisdom grows and your troubles are reduced. You don't lose those relationships after scolding them. You know. So the bodhis Bodhisattva is able to do that. It's like a fire extinguisher. Ain't easy, man. That's work. And it's, it's actually natural because he overcomes it like the re fire retardant is overcoming the, the flames. Then it goes on to say, this bodhisattva emphasizes the paramita of vows from among the 10 paramitas. It's not that he doesn't do the others, but he does so according to his strength. Okay, this is part of the boilerplate. What is it? Um, 10 perfections, 10 practices. Everybody else talks about six perfections. The Avatamsaka adds four. So the Avatamsaka is always doing tens of tens of tens. So number eight, is vows the perfection of vows and that's what he emphasizes okay seven did another one six did another one five did another one so this is that conclusion this is a general description of the bodhisattva's eighth stage called unmoving stage even in limitlessly many eons you couldn't talk about it to the end there's more and more and more okay there we go Hey, hey, so um, this is a, we've touched this text and, and uh, named it as the, uh, the Buddha's, after his awakening, he said, maybe somebody wants to be a Bodhisattva, here's how. And laid it out on a, on a, uh, in a systematic document. Here's, Here's what it is, and I'm I love doing it because this this wisdom has been around for all this time, and it's a it's a public domain. This is a Creative Commons license document. Should we choose to, you know, what do we get from it? Hmm. The the amount of focus and concentration we put on this wholesome insight. 
that's however much we get out of it. So, all right. Um, Buddha Root Farm coming up. Do I, let's see here. Do I have Buddha Root Farm here? No, I don't have the, I, I can take us to it. Okay, here we go. Are we ready? Um, here's where you see. If I open, um, I'll just give you the give you the address. I won't try to open it up. So the address is. Hold on. There's no www. H T T P. Or slash. Oregon dot berkeley monastery dot org no forward slash no dot au if you're in australia you got to add a dot au so buddha root farm is our summer camp in the oregon coastal mountains happens on july 21st to july 28 and people are welcome to investigate that um it's just terrific by golly the, uh, oh, hold on, close this one and cancel that one. There we go. Yeah, oregon.berkeleymonastery.org. That will take you out to where you can find all kinds of information about this. It's the thing about Buddha Root Farm is it's camping. We're, it's fairly vigorous. We're out there in the, uh, in the weather, which is usually helpful. There, the, uh, ben is is gesturing, giving us bear-like gestures. There are bears, there are bears, but they are full of raspberries. They they put they put their paws together, paws together, please. They are full of berries, and so people don't taste as good as berries. And uh, now this is my uh, take on it, and somebody may laugh, but my experience is because um, because. It rains in Oregon nine months out of the year. Everything is soft and green. And this, there are thorns in things, but they're not nasty thorns. Uh, there are mosquitoes, but they're not nasty mosquitoes. The, uh, everything is soft in the Oregon mountains because of the rain. It's it's very gentle landscape. And I'm getting a message from Locke that says it's nearly full. So I, I'm going to stop advertising it pretty soon because uh, we don't want people to get excited and then be disappointed that the full means 80 people, right? We did 100 one year and that was too many. It strained the, the toilets, it strained the, the meals and uh, made it hard to hear it during lecture. Mostly I do the lectures without a mic because everybody can hear and it's really quiet on the mountaintop up there. No cell phone coverage, no signal. We're too far. We're out in the, the, the mountains. There are mountain lions. We've seen them. Uh, there's lots and lots of beautiful deer that come around and totally unafraid. Um, and it's a tremendous outdoors experience of being in nature, studying the Dharma together. And uh, yeah. Somebody has asked about reciting Medicine Buddha mantra 108 times every day. Um, yeah. Any mantra that you want to recite 108 times a day will increase your ability to focus your mind. The nature of the, tech, the mantra that you're reciting will, uh, depending on how quiet your mind is, will be emphasized. If it's medicine buddha um then his the, the medicine buddha sutra sutra the past vows of medicine buddha um we have a translation of that in drba that will bring out the qualities of healing and wholesome harmony body and mind um, different mantras have different qualities. So Medicine Buddha's vows have to do with healing. So that's that's what that's about. And it's fantastic. Uh, I haven't heard that 108 times a day is, is a 
common practice, it certainly won't hurt at all. It's a helpful practice. 108 great compassion mantras of Guanyin Bodhisattva is a practice I know a lot about. Um, the medicine Buddha mantra, Namo Boche Fadi Bishasha, that one, is um, I, I recite it seven times. I'm in the habit of that. 21 times people can recite it. Some people recite it all day long. They just keep going. Um, I have a wonderful story about that mantra and uh, I'll, I'll finish with that today. Um, there's a, a Dharma friend who's passed away not too long ago, Peter Nye. Peter Nye is responsible for, for helping to build Gold Coast Dharma Realm. Uh, Peter was uh, in Malaysia. I think he was disciple 003. Not to be confused with 007. That's nothing, no relationship to 007. He was the third uh, person to take refuge in Malaysia with Master Shrin Hua back in 1978. Peter was a fine guy, known and beloved to many. And uh, he and his best buddy in the monastery, a guy named uh, Wang, K.L. Wang, Wang Guangliang, was disciple 002. <laughs> Two of them uh, found Master Hua, discovered him in 1978, took refuge and became steadfast disciples. Well, K.L. Wang and Peter were best buds and uh, best mates, and uh, K.L. Wang got sick. And his, uh, there was a mysterious illness. He fell into a coma and became non-responsive, not dead, just non-responsive. It's kind of a vegetable. Nobody knew what to do with, with K.L. Wang, what was wrong? And uh, so it went on for a couple of weeks, I think. And the family was in despair. Is, is he dead? Is he alive? What's going on? And, you know, it was just suddenly. And so Peter, uh, knowing their preferences when they were cultivating together, said, ah, he said, uh, K.L. Wong really uh, liked the medicine, all the teachings around medicine Buddha. So I'm going to recite the, the Yao Shi Guan Ding Chen Yin, Medicine Buddha's mantra for anointing the crown with, with oil. And so he got his, took his beads and sat down by Kale Wong's bedside where he was stretched out like a, like a, a zombie, you know, just unmoving, unresponsive. And beside his ear, he started reciting. Namo bo che fa di bi sha shi ju lu bi liu li bo la po ho la shi ya da ho jero ya la. Bi sha shi bi sha shi bi sha mo jero so ho. He recited that mantra uh, for a couple hours. And he did it in the morning and he did it at night. And just, you know, that became something he did. He just sat beside his friend's ear as he lay in the bed and recited in a quiet voice. Namo bo che fa di bi sha shi ju lu bi liu li. Like that. And uh, I think he also said uh, in his mind, he said, dear medicine Buddha, Yao Shifu, he said, if my friend can come back, I will devote myself to the propagation of the medicine Buddha Sutra and mantra. So please let my friend wake up. So he recited. <laughs> the family was in the dialogue to say, when do we pull the plug? You know. When do we stop this artificially preserving his life? When K.L. Wong opened his eyes and sat up. <laughs> Don't, I'm back. And then we go, ah, where were you? What happened? What, 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 what? And he said, yeah, golly. He says, funny, I just was wandering. It was dark and I was out there wandering. And there was no sun, there was no moon. And I couldn't tell north, south, east, west. And then I heard this sound. And I just, you know, I just followed the sound and it got louder and I followed the sound and I followed the sound and I'm back. And the family goes, what sound was that? He said, you know, that, that uh, mantra, you know, the, the, the medicine mantra, Namo Boche, if that was it. I just, it was like a lifeline. And I came right back, here I am, you know. <laughs> and it was, you know, giving Peter and I big hugs and, and so what did Peter do? Peter reprinted the Medicine Buddha Sutra and beautiful edition. And you, there are bunches of them right there in the Buddha Hall. That's at Berkeley Monastery. I can see the box in the 
back there, there on the altar, on the balcony. Those those sutras are right there from uh, Peter's vow. So uh, this question is, you know, should you recite it 108 times? I would say recite it until you can without looking at the book and then recite it as needed. Uh, you never know when you might want to recite it a long time, you know. So that's a, that's my own experience, a true story. Okay, uh, Jinwei Shi, do you want to announce any any information there, and then we'll dedicate merit, and and I'll see you in a couple weeks. Be back on the third, which is a Sunday, I think. So, yeah, the next next lecture is yours. Is Jin Jin Fu or Jin Chuan? Right. So it's your turn next. So one week from today. That's right. That's right. Yep. In person. In person. Flesh and blood. Yeah. Okay. Dedicate the merit here. And thank you all for joining. And as they say at Passover every year in Jewish tradition, next year in Jerusalem, right? Next year in Jerusalem, next year and next week in Berkeley. So there we go. Jerusalem. Okay. Please make a wish. We'll send it around the planet. Here we go. Okay, extend your mind around the planet, that's what counts. May every living being, our minds as one and with life, share the fruits of peace, with hearts of goodness, luminous and bright. If people hear and see, our hands and hearts can find in giving unity. May our minds to great wisdom and to joy. May kindness find reward, may all sorrow be their grief and pain. May this boundless light dispel the darkness of their endless night. Because our hearts are one, this world of pain turns into paradise. May all become compassionate and wise. May all become compassionate. Hey, Jin Wei Shi or Jin Shou, do you want to lead everybody in bowing? And we'll see you in a couple weeks. Bye bye.